going to the waste Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the Regional Wastewater Reclamation uh, Department's Advisory Committee meeting uh, for January 26. Um, uh, Veronica, uh, we have form, you said? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, Veronica, can you please do the roll call? Scott Oldendorf? Here. Claire Zucker? Here. Steve Foley? Here. Allison Jones? Here. Scott Colt? Here. Rob Kulikowski? Here. Armando Membria. Presente. Mark Taylor. Here. Amory Wolf. Here. Are there any committee members that I missed that I did not call? No. Nope. All right, very good. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, next on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on the agenda is the call to the audience. Do I have any uh, comments uh, from the call to the audience? This is Jackson. Good morning, everyone. I'm just going to take that opportunity to uh, number one, introduce Jeanette Lee. I don't know if you can see Jeanette. Raise your hand, Jeanette. Um, Jeanette will be taking over this uh, coordination role function that Veronica has done numerous times. Again, we play musical chairs and do different things. So uh, it, I just wanted to introduce you to Jeanette and we'll see. Veronica may be here next time, maybe not. We'll see what happens. And, um, that was one announcement. And then second, I'm used to seeing Kim Challender on the call or on the team. I don't think she's on there right now. No. But just a shout out and thanks to Kim from Supervisor Scott's office because she actually headed up one of our grease collection sites earlier this month. And uh, we appreciated her time and effort. It was a busy site and uh, she helped us out tremendously. So. Thanks to Kim. That's all I got. All right. Thank you very much, Jackson. Any more uh, comments? Call to the audience. OK, uh, next. Um, don't everybody jump up at once now. Uh, we have safety share. So uh, please, uh, somebody stand up instead of Jackson all the time. <laughs> That's where we play the Jeopardy song. I, I have okay. a safety share. All right, thank you very much, ma'am. Um, ladders. Uh, everyone has them in their house. They're extremely dangerous. Uh, please remember if you're on a ladder to not be reaching far away, not to get on the top step. Um, a few years ago, a good friend of mine Lee Allison, who is the Arizona State Geologist, died after he fell off a ladder painting in his living room. And it happens way more often than you'd think. Um, I think it's a good practice to not use a ladder if you're home alone. Um, at least have somebody there who can call 911 if you fall off. Uh, and uh, if possible, pay a young person to use a ladder in your house instead of doing it yourself. That's my strategy. Thank you. I'll piggyback on that if I may. Um, typically, no one watches where they're walking. I mean, they're looking ahead, but they're not looking down um, in the area that they're walking around. And um, it um, could surprise you with trips and falls. And as you get older, you're um, you're not as flexible as you used to be, and you don't bounce very well off off the ground or the concrete. And I'm not speaking from experience, but I did notice somebody do that, and, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't a very uh, 
happy outcome for that person. So especially if you're working, that leads to many uh, uh, non-reportable and reportable injuries. So watch where you're going. I'll just add, uh, just remember we're having freezes every now and then. Uh, so just err on the side of caution. If you see a kind of a dark wet spot for walking or for driving, just assume it could be black ice. You're just never sure. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for safety shares. Um, next is the approval of the minutes. Uh, these are the minutes from December 15th, uh, 2022. Are there any amendments, corrections, or anything? Okay, hearing no amendments or corrections, uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? I move we approve the minutes. I I'll second it. Thank you very much. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any uh, nays? Any abstains? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next, um, in the discussion and action uh, category of the agenda, we have the Colorado River Conservation uh, with Grant, uh, Andrew Greenhill from uh, Teton Water. Andrew, it's all yours. Mm. Well, great. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I got the request to present a little bit on Colorado River <clears throat> uh, issues and also a little bit on conservation and what the city's up to in both areas. So uh, if it's OK, I'll just jump into the presentation. <clears throat> OK, can everybody see the screen? Yes, we can see it. <clears throat> OK. So again, just I'll give an overview of some Colorado River um, issues uh, related to the city and then some of the efforts that we're uh, undergoing when it comes to conservation. <clears throat> so first, just an overview of Tucson water. As many of you know, um, you know, nearly uh, 750,000 people are served by Tucson water. The service area gets close to about 400 square miles. Uh, and you can see some of the stats there on the screen about the, the size and scale of the of the potable water delivery system, as well as uh, the reclaim system and other uh, tenant parts and reaches, of course, as many of you know, um, across the city of Tucson, but also into other jurisdictions in our area. Uh, some of the things that we deal with uh, when we think about water, it's just not thinking about having sufficient water. And I know that's the attention that we're, you know, we, we're paying a lot of attention to those issues lately. But uh, for, you know, for the governing body, the mayor and council and the city, you know, we look at a number of different issues as we think about policies related to water. We're certainly looking at water reliability, but also resiliency, um, how we deal with uh, climate change and mitigation, uh, communi communities, quality of life. We think about affordability, accessibility, and uh, equity and social justice when we think about our all of our policies uh, you know, that we use to govern the system. And then, of course, we're looking uh, to ensure public confidence and safe, high quality water water supplies. Um, as some of you may know, uh, but just to give an overview and give a sense of where Colorado River fits into our uh, overall system, there are basically four different water sources that we consider as part of our portfolio. There's Colorado River water, of course, and I'll talk mostly about that today. But there's also groundwater, which was our historic primary system until the CAP became available to Tucson. Uh, but groundwater is primarily a backup uh, water source for us. Then there's the recycled water system. <clears throat> and actually, we're celebrating our 40th year of, of having our recycled or reclaimed water system uh, operational here in Tucson. And then an area that we're looking quite a bit at uh, currently and trying to expand is the use of rainwater and stormwater. And I'll talk a little bit about some of our efforts in those areas uh, here. So first, a sense of overall, what is our main water uh, source over time and how much water do we use? 
Uh, this chart shows kind of the history of Tucson water going back to 1940. Um, both the the shape of the of the chart as well as the colors kind of tell the story. In short, from 1940 till about the year 2000, that dark blue, which is the groundwater, that was our primary water source in our region. Uh, and you could see as the community grew, the amount of water that we delivered each year grew along with that growth. But right after the year 2000, we started implementing uh, our use of Colorado River water. And you can see that in the light blue over time, we've pretty much been able to stop the use of groundwater and primarily use that light blue or the Colorado River water from uh, about 2000, a little bit after the year 2000 and on. And that's been our practice uh, from, uh, from that period on. Uh, also important to notice the shape of the graph, as you can see that um, the highest water use was about that year 2000, and you can see that demand has gone down since that year. It stabilized a bit uh, in the last few years, but uh, that connection between um, population and water use uh, isn't as um, direct as it's been in the past. That's a credit, of course, to the citizens of Tucson and, and uh, users who have uh, been using less water either through technology, efficiency, education, uh, other means to use to use less water. Uh, with the use of the Colorado River water, um, you can see here uh, areas in our region where uh, where groundwater levels have uh, been depleted or, or, or reduced over time and where they've increased. As we've turned off those groundwater wells, you can see in that central area of Tucson uh, where you've got the light, the cooler colors, the light greens and blues, uh, where the water levels are starting to increase, uh, the hotter or darker um, colors, the reds, the browns, that's where we continue to see some reduction in, uh, in groundwater levels. And then there's that spot out there in Avra Valley that's purple, blue, uh, and that's uh, where we collect our, our Colorado River water and conduct our recharge and recovery uh, program. And you can see there that the water levels there uh, have increased um, uh, quite a bit as we have put water into the ground uh, over there. So now to talk a little bit about Colorado River and some of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, you can see here, this is actually a moment in time back in February of 2001, and this is what some folks like to call the bucket chart or thimble chart, but it gives a sense of where water levels are in the different reservoirs across the Colorado River Basin. Uh, this is back again February of 2021. This is uh, the source of this information is from CAP, and you can see that Lake Powell is about 38% of capacity, Lake Mead at about 41%. Then you could even see some of those upper basin, smaller reservoirs that are at various levels um, of, of capacity. Uh, and if you can compare that to the next slide, you can see in December of 2022, uh, just last month, you can see what's happened where Lake Powell is down to 25%, Lake Mead to 28%, and even some of those upper level, uh, upper basin reservoirs have also gone down in capacity as well. Um, so this just gives you a snapshot of how quickly and significantly there are issues uh, of reduced uh, of reduced water in the basin, uh, and that is what is um, triggering uh, the the level of response and the variety of responses by the federal government and by uh, states and and users across the basin. So just to explain, uh, last year uh, we have a system in place that determines what are the cuts that different uh, states and entities sustain at different levels of shortage on the Colorado River. Uh, this past year was the first year we were in a, uh, a declared shortage, a tier one shortage. Uh, that means that the, uh, the amount of water that was projected to be in Lake Mead uh, as of January 1st of last year was below 1,075 feet. As a result of the tier one shortage and under that shortage, uh, there's a reduction of water uh, to Arizona. And in particular, 
those cuts are sustained by users along the CAP uh, water system. So this gives you a sense of uh, how much water out of that about 1.6 million acre feet that in previous years was diverted off the Colorado into the CAP canal for CAP water users. You can see uh, what uh, the cut was. It was about 512,000 acre feet. This is not the total reduction. There were some other contributions as well, um, as you know, Mark Taylor, who's on your committee, can tell you more about. But in terms of the required cuts, this chart gives you a sense of what those were last year. Uh, the colors on that chart uh, give a set, uh, talk about or, or signify the different water uh, users and priorities on uh, as far as Colorado River water is concerned. Uh, it's a little hard to see in this chart, but that top level that gets cut first in any shortage is what's called excess CAP. The light green uh, is uh, ag water, uh, and that has been cut pretty much altogether uh, from those cuts. And the yellow is what's called non-Indian agriculture water. Uh, about two thirds of that was cut last year. Um, Tucson water supply is in the light blue, which are municipal and industrial supplies that, that towards the bottom. Uh, this chart, the priorities are kind of at the bottom. Think of it as a cup of water where if there are cuts, it comes off the top. So if you're lower on the chart, you're in a higher priority. And Tucson's supply is a uh, part of that MNI or municipal industrial that was not affected by the tier one cuts. In 2023, the current year, we are now in a 2A shortage, which is a higher level of shortage. And uh, as you can see here, uh, and what that means is that uh, the the lake lake mead level is um, uh, below 1050 feet at the beginning of the year but it's above 1045 feet and per different agreements uh, that puts us in what's called a 2a shortage so we've gone from 1 to 2a as far as the impact to arizona it cuts arizona's uh, uh, diversion by 80,000 acre feet uh, so we've gone from 512 to 592,000 acre feet and as you can see in the chart on the right, in a tier 2A shortage, uh, those extra cuts from tier 1 do start to impede on municipal and industrial and that dark blue, which are Indian water supplies. Uh, but we don't believe that Tucson will sustain uh, any cuts in our allocation this year, but we're right at that point where if there are uh, greater levels of shortage declared, uh, there would be some cuts to uh, the amount of water that would come to Tucson. So what are we doing in 2023 to address some of these issues locally? Uh, the first I'd mention is the Bureau of Reclamation has put out a call for system conservation, meaning they're going to water users and offering uh, on a voluntary basis if uh, an agency wants to leave water uh, in the system and not take it, they could receive some compensation for that. Tucson did participate last year uh, to the tune of about 25,000 acre feet. Uh, that is out of Tucson's annual allocation, which is 144,000, a little bit above 144,000 acre feet. That was a decision of the mayor and council. Uh, Tucson did receive some compensation uh, for that water, which we're going to be using mostly towards um, the cost of a groundwater treatment plant to deal with some of our PFAS issues. Looking ahead, the Bureau has uh, offered uh, entities uh, the, the opportunity to participate uh, for up one to three years uh, at different levels of compensation per acre foot of water contributed, and Tucson is currently in discussions with the Bureau and others as to what degree, uh, uh, if in, in whether we would participate and to what degree we'd participate in system conservation in 2023, 24, and 25. We're also participating in the Arizona Reconsultation Committee, uh, which uh, is looking at uh, the 2007 shortage sharing guidelines, uh, which is a 20 year agreement that expires at the end of 2026. Uh, Tucson Water is at the table with other state leaders 
uh, and representing other uh, water stakeholders across the state and talking about what those guidelines should look like post 2026. We also continue our federal and state outreach, uh, working with our congressional delegation, uh, the Department of Interior, the Bureau and others, uh, as, as many other entities are in uh, thinking about what, what other actions uh, need to be taken to address uh, Colorado River issues. Tucson was one of the uh, signed on to an MOU or memo of understanding uh, with other cities across the basin, Denver, Los Angeles, um, Phoenix, Las Vegas, where we've all pledged to do more when it comes to conservation within our own systems. What can we do with our, our ratepayers, our customers to try to conserve water and, and reduce demand? And for the rest of my presentation, I'll kind of give an overview of some of those efforts that we're doing locally. Uh, first, rainwater harvesting and storm to shade, uh, which is some rainwater stormwater efforts. Then uh, a look at what we're doing and looking at in terms of other uh, efforts towards customer conservation. And then I'll end with uh, a look at our long range uh, planning that we're doing, looking ahead to the year 2100 and soliciting input from the community on uh, what we should be doing to make sure we have an affordable, sustainable, equitable water supply uh, into the future. So first with rainwater and stormwater, some of you may be aware of some of our historic programs when it comes to providing uh, incentives and rebates for customers doing uh, rainwater harvesting, especially uh, the uh, what we like to call active or passive. The passive is doing earthwork. Uh, on your private property to try to capture rainwater and utilize that with the uh, expectation or hope that people would use less uh, Tucson water, municipal water, and those pr uh, programs are very popular and continue. Uh, we also have active systems, uh, whether it's pumps or, or cisterns, where people can collect uh, rainwater on their property and again, uh, store it and utilize it uh, and then uh, use less uh, municipal water Again, those programs continue. The area where we're uh, doing a lot more these days, uh, and uh, I have some new information on that I'll present, is in the area of stormwater. How can we collect, especially on the public areas, public rights of way, how can we collect and put stormwater to greater use? Um, this year uh, marks, uh, or, or 2021, I should say, last year, uh, we've done some estimates. It's hard to uh, to get a, a, an accurate or a fully accurate sense of how much water we've been able to offset by the use of rainwater capture in our system. But using some uh, guidelines and estimates, we believe that we've reached a total of about 100 million uh, gallons of water, um, about 315 acre feet in total, uh, that's been saved by our community by utilizing the rainwater uh, harvesting uh, programs that we've uh, promoted and used in the past. And now what we're doing is we've we've uh, initiated a program called Storm to Shade. Uh, this is uh, what I described before about trying to do better, uh, get better uh, use and efficiency from stormwater in our community. These are also called green stormwater infrastructure programs. And basically it's about utilizing, um, uh, you know, uh, parking lots, streets, uh, other areas in the community and putting in those systems that can direct water towards landscaping and again, other beneficial uses so that um, it can uh, help us deal with urban heat island effect. And again, just provide other benefits to the community and put every every drop of water that we have at our disposal to beneficial use. And when it's done right, here's a good picture of what we're trying to do with the curb cuts uh and uh the basins uh and again in trying to utilize that water there's even a benefit in getting that water off the roadway to preserve uh the roadway uh quality uh and again uh do it in a smart way that we can uh, again getting the, all those beneficial uses um from that storm water uh in 2023 actually right at the end of 2022 uh, our mayor and council approved making the storm to shade program permanent it was a pilot program beforehand. Uh, this year, we're looking to increase the number of those projects citywide. And again, we do so with an eye to affordability and equity. Uh, we're especially looking at areas uh, that uh, 
that sustain a, a increased heat island effect, either with limited landscaping or a greater amount of hard uh, surfaces. And uh, we, we're trying to uh, first look at er those areas as areas that might be eligible uh, where we can find funding for um, increased storm to shade projects. Next, I'll talk about some of our local conservation programs. So you can see from the photos, these are well-known uh, programs where Tucson Water has provided incentives and rebates over the years, uh, and uh, they are very popular and highly utilized programs. We have our high efficiency toilet rebate programs, clothes washers, uh, rainwater harvesting, as I've mentioned, gray water. Uh, these are all programs, again, that are utilized widely uh, throughout the community. We continue to look at at them, we monitor the data that we collect from the utilization of these programs, and we always try to tinker and look at opportunities to expand them. Uh, education is a big part, of course, of what we do, and we our staff continues to go out to schools, out through the community, uh, through the bill inserts to try to uh, recommend ideas and educate the community on ways to uh, save water. In terms of conservation, there's actually quite a bit of activity uh, going on this year, given the issues on the Colorado River uh, and the desire by our mayor and council to increase conservation. We're looking at some new uh, ideas that include uh, perhaps restricting or banning non-functional non turf restrictions. Uh, I'll be honest, the definition of non-functional is something that we're still uh, drilling down on. You know, we don't want to remove uh, yards necessarily on residential, certainly not school yards or parks. Uh, but if there are areas where the turf is ornamental, uh, we are looking at potentially joining with some other cities that already either ban or provide uh, for those non-functional turf or give uh, rebates or incentives for turf removal. But that is something we're still looking at. EPA water sense fixture requirements. Uh, these are just uh, looking at perhaps uh, adding some new requirements that uh, lead people to use uh, more efficient fixtures, again, like the toilets and other, other household fixtures. Low impact development and net zero requirements. What can we do uh, with our uh, building requirements to uh, either require or incentivize uh, the, uh, the collection and, and more beneficial use of rainwater and stormwater on site? or even to look in the direction of, of how we can get to a point where new development uses minimal um, water uh, or outside water and maximum use of uh, renewable or just like rainwater and other water supplies and reducing consumption. Irrigation meters for new large developments is something we've been looking at where the idea is perhaps if the outdoor usage is on an irrigation meter, perhaps that would lead users to use less irrigation water. And then the last one I'll mention is tiered commercial rates. Right now we have tiered rates for residential. Um, the, uh, the Our Citizens Water Advisory Committee, of which Allison is a member of course, and our mayor and council have given direction to look at the possibility of uh, implementing commercial rates or tiered rates for commercial. It's a complicated subject and staff is still looking at it. I'll also note, if you look at the photo in the slide, uh, at the One Water Summit in Milwaukee last year, they announced that this year's uh, national annual conference will be in Tucson. I believe that will be in November. And that is the national conference uh, where a lot of these ideas and best practices are discussed amongst uh, other cities and areas around the country and uh, national leaders in that subject. Finally, and I'll leave you with this today, uh, we are undergoing our One Water 2100 long range planning. We're looking at, again, all those four, the four different sources of water. What can we do to uh, maximize uh, the efficiency of those, wa of those uh, systems of water, or of those water sources? Uh, how can we make sure, again, that we have enough water uh, in a fair and equitable, affordable, uh, safe quality, uh, you know, water system uh, in the year 2100 and beyond. And again, these are some of the, the, the values or qualities that we bring uh, to how we uh, reach those goals uh, that I mentioned. And I want to encourage uh, members of RURAC and others, uh, please 
Uh, if you're interested, go take the survey. We are uh, soliciting input from the community on uh, what uh, what policies, what programs uh, the city should under undertake and again in order to reach those goals for the year 2100 uh, at our website. Um, I believe the, the web address is that TucsonOneWater.com. And with that, uh, I want to thank you for, uh, for uh, the invitation and for listening to this presentation today. I'm happy to try to answer any questions and uh, encourage you again to continue to, to look at our policies and programs, uh, give us your input, utilize those incentives if you qualify. And um, again, we're happy to partner with anyone and everyone uh, to do everything we can to address some of these Colorado River issues and ensure, again, that uh, sustainable water supply into the future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Andrew, I'd like for your consideration uh, to forward your slide presentation um, to the Board of Supervisors and the members uh, here of the Advisory Committee. Uh, sports supervisors might want to be using this uh, for their constituents and stuff like that. Um, are there any uh, questions for Andrew? Andrew, uh, this Absolutely. is Scott Oldendorf. I do have one question. Um, with all this layering of uh, the the big four, the, the, the groundwater, Colorado River, rainstorm and recycling, how does wastewater play into this uh, formula uh, with the reclamation that we do here? Is there any uh, amount of participation that we can give back into, uh, you know, the aquifer or anything like that? Um, or are we just insignificant that uh, we are very efficient what we use up? Uh, well, thanks, Scott, for the question. Well, no, Pima County's wastewater system is an important component here. Uh, obviously, it's a source of that reclaimed water system, which again is one of the four uh, water sources in our portfolio. Uh, Pima County efforts in the past and, and in the recent past to improve the quality of the wastewater through the ROMP uh, program um, and uh, our partnership uh, when it comes to uh, making sure that we uh, we get our our um, allocation of of wastewater that comes out of the system and treating it and putting it into our reclaimed water system is uh, is the source of that water. Uh, so uh, your operations or the operations of the county wastewater system are critically important, and the value of that reclaimed or recycled water across the system is is significant. I also want to mention that um, you know the primary recipient of the rights to water out of the Pima County wastewater system is um, the Tahona Odom Nation and uh, the Secretary of Interior on behalf of the nation uh, utilizes that water, if not directly uh, through the accumulation of the credits from that water. And that's an important source of, of funding uh, for the Tahona Odom Nation. So. So whether it's for the nation or for Tucson or the county itself or for other users, uh, the, the, the efficient uh, operation of the wastewater system is critically important. Again, our one water look is looking at every single drop and those drops are important as well. Very good, thank you, Andrew. Uh, Mark Taylor has a question for you, Andrew. Yeah, hey, thanks, Andrew, that was great today. Yeah, I was curious um, about the GPCD, um, and I wasn't sure, you know, we've always watched a, a gradual decline here for like 10 years or more. Is that still declining, and and where do you think that GP, GPCD trend's going to go? Yeah, great questions, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the technical expert on this, but you can see how there was a decline from that year 2000 down towards the present. Uh, in terms of, of total overall demand. And important to mention uh, that the amount of water we're delivering today overall is about the same amount that we delivered back in 19, in the mid 1980s. So here we are, you know, they're almost 30 years later uh, with about 200,000 more people uh, on our system. And yet we're delivering the same amount of water we did years ago. 
So that GPCD or gallons per capita per day has gone down. And you know, looking at some of the reasons for that and what will the trends be in the future is something we look at closely. Uh, hard, uh, I'd say the last few years, it's gotten a little spiky. It's gone up a little bit in a year, then down a bit. And so, you know, have we plateaued is a fair question. And that's something we'll continue to look at. But as you can see from some of the programs we're looking at uh, at the city, uh, we are interested in, in doing everything we can and doing more than we already do to try to drive down demand. Uh, so uh, it, it remains to be seen. Has the pandemic changed uh, what people do? Uh, will there be more participation in, in some of these programs that will drive down uh, GPCD, especially in the residential side? We really just, we don't know yet. And with, the, with that up and down in the last few years, uh, that gives us reason to pause and to, or at least to see, you know, what those, what, what that might mean. You know, have we plateaued? Have there been things that have happened during the pandemic that have changed behavior? Uh, washing hands for 20 seconds, right? You know, has, has that, uh, uh, you know, did that lead to some increase that we hadn't seen in previous years? So really hard to say, but it's something we watch, of course, very, very closely. Yeah, and just a quick follow up. Uh, I'm curious, you know, if we, well, we're obviously going to have some pretty major additional cuts in surface water and CAP, and depending on what that could be, and I know you have a lot of conservation, new conservation ideas and processes you're looking at, including turf and others. Do you have a feel, if we do have some pretty major cuts in CAP, how much more you can go beyond where you are today? with some more drastic ideas and turf pro turf removal programs. Have you looked at say, okay, I could actually cut my water use by another 20% if I implement all these programs or have we got to that point yet? Uh, the, the looking, uh, the, the, the staff analysis of turf reduction or turf removal uh, as a component of, of what other things we may do to try to drive down demand or, or, or use uh, is still something that's uh, that's underway, and I don't really have more information yet on on that. Uh, but you know, the the community should know that you know we are our annual allocation is 144,000 acre feet of Colorado River water. Uh, in, in our recent years, our demand has been our total demand has been around 100,000 acre feet. Uh, so there is a delta there, and we've been able to store that extra 40 plus thousand acre feet or more uh, in Avra Valley. Um, so, you know, we do have uh, some storage that we'll be able to use uh, first, if indeed our water, uh, uh, surface water allocations are cut. There's also the Arizona Water Banking Authority, and we have, uh, you know, we have some credits with the Water Banking Authority that we may be able to utilize. And then again, you know, we have our historic groundwater uh, that we would that you know we have available uh, and want to make sure is available in high quality. Uh, so you know we believe that we have a pretty resilient supply here in in the Tucson area and in the Tucson water system. Uh, but that doesn't uh, that doesn't stop us from continuing to look at like you saw you know any and every way we can try to drive down that demand. And one thing I'll just mention on the turf, you know a lot of our outdoor irrigation use, especially when it comes to ball fields and parks is already on the reclaimed water or recycled water system. So uh, it's not a direct one to one that uh, if, um, you know, if th that, uh, that a cut, well, you know, that Colorado River cuts would impact those programs. So, you know, and again, we'll, we'll continue to do what we can to get more folks on reclaimed with the hope that that would uh, reduce their Colorado River demand. Cool. Thanks, Andrew. Sure, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Claire Zucker has a question for you, Andrew. You're muted, Claire. Go. Yeah. Yep. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was that was really great. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one was that stormwater uh, estimates seem low. I'm wondering if that's based on the amount of sort of proven reduction based on your customer base and whether you're also considering the amount of water that would be or has been 
saved because of your beneficial projects? In other words, are you you're making a lot of efforts for storm to shade? Are you also counting those numbers which maybe wouldn't have been spent before, but are in fact a savings to the community in terms of the benefit they get? Right. So thanks, Claire. Uh, the it, it, it's clearly um, hard to quantify at this point, and it's a new area of focus for us. Again, at the direction of our mayor and city council, you know, we have started to include that rainwater, stormwater piece to the chart. Uh, and, and again, those are estimates. Uh, so, we, you know, we're part of expanding the, uh, the use of rainwater and stormwater. Uh, is also trying to drill down on on uh, metrics and how we can measure that. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we do uh, talk regularly with other cities, other areas around the country and look at their programs. What are they doing? How do they measure uh, how much water they are uh, off demand? They're offsetting or saving when it comes to uh, more efficient utilization of rainwater and stormwater. So, uh, you know, I, I can get more information for the committee about how we've gotten to some of the estimates that we've gotten to so far. But again, I just you know want to be upfront yeah. that uh, this is an evolving uh, area, uh, but it's an important one. And you know we've had presentations at our mayor and council uh, by uh, Brad Lancaster and other local experts when it comes to uh, you know, again, just utilizing rainwater and stormwater. And uh, you know there's a lot of interest, and now there'll be even more funding that's going towards uh, expanding some of these programs. So we're hopeful. And then the one other thing I'll mention is uh, the uh, the state of Arizona uh, in last year's legislative session passed that WIPA bill that I think many people are, are uh, that know about. And I know there's a lot of attention on the money in that bill that's going towards uh, potential augmentation programs. But there is $200 million that was allocated, that was included in that appropriation uh, for conservation programs. And so uh, we'll be looking at that as another potential source of funding to match with some of our local funding to do even more, especially in this area of uh, rainwater and stormwater capture. Well, I, I have one more question, but first I want to just say it wasn't so long ago that stormwater was unthinkable as far as mentioning in a public utility, water utility presentation. And so it's just big applause for for everyone for expanding their thinking about that. Um, my other question was with regards to um, the water that you're currently storing for others in the aquifer and the fact that even though you have a nice amount that you're not that you're currently getting per year uh, allocated over the amount you used some of that some some water may be requested from from your resources in the aquifer, which means you would need to take that water through cap and it may not be available. So uh, along those lines, it's a complicated and I know it's an unseen future, but are you moving more towards uh, developing a withdrawal plan of actual wet water from the aquifer? Yeah, I, I apologize, Claire. I'm not sure I, I followed your question, but, but it, it, and but let, let me take a shot at it. And if I didn't, if I don't answer you, you know, let me know and I'll I'll see if I see if I can. But, you know, we do have um, yeah, out in Aver Valley, as you said, we store water for other local providers. And what we do is we wheel water through our system. So uh, Oro Valley Vale Water Company, uh, others, you know, they they send their water to uh, Tucson's Aver Valley Storage and Recovery Projects and then we move water through our distribution system for them. So um, don't you also have water from from Phoenix area? And right. you're storing that. And so if you if they wanted that water from your storage, you would then reduce your your draw on cap and they would take the water up there. So that means your actual water coming here would be reduced potentially below the allocated amount or not the allocated amount but the amount you anticipate so that's what i'm saying is there's there's some numbers going on there there are numbers going on you're right and um but and and, and just so uh we're all clear what, what claire's talking about in case you're 
and where uh, in Tucson we do store water for Phoenix. Uh, we have over the years, and I believe it's up to about 100,000 acre feet that we've stored for Phoenix, meaning they've sent their water to us. It's stored in the ground. And the way it would work is if Phoenix wanted that water back, uh, what we would do is we would order some of Tucson's CAP water and have it delivered to Phoenix turnouts uh, so that they would get that water back. So it, it's not the same molecules, right? It's just, it, but it's right. not the, that That's equitable, that numbers. equal amount. So <laughs> you're right in the sense that if if Phoenix were to want to uh, get some of that water back, they would let Tucson know, and then we would arrange to make sure that our annual that some of our annual amount that gets delivered, some of it would go to Phoenix. But keep in mind, and and that would mean less water to Tucson. But keep in mind that in past years they've sent more water to us, right? So we've gotten more water. Uh, that we've again been able to put in the ground and store, uh, so we have that water available and accessible to us. So for every acre foot that they may take from a future allocation, uh, we can then take from the water they've already stored for us and have available for us as needed. So it evens out in the end. As long as you can get it out of the ground. <laughs> well, right. And, and so, you know, with with our Avra Valley storage and recovery projects, we would work that the same way we work our our uh, our own Tucson water allocation. Again, we put the water in CAVSARP and SAFSARP, our central Avra Valley and southern Avra Valley storage and recovery. The water percolates uh, in basins down through the soils into the ground, and then we um, we uh, through through wells in the region, we recover that water and uh, deliver it through our distribution system. So it wouldn't be any different from the water that uh, we already um, store and recover from that area. Thank you very much, um, Claire and Andrew. Uh, Andrew, I've got one more for you. I have Allison Jones. Uh, she has a question for you. Hey, Andrew. Good to see you here. Uh, I wanted to thank you for that uh, that chart that we've seen many times on CWAC showing the various types of water uh, and the sources uh, over time. Um, every time that slide shows up at CWAC, we go a little crazy because it, it always said Tucson water production and it showed rainwater and har harvest rainwater harvesting and that is not a Tucson water production. And so you changed the title of that slide to sources or something like that. It it makes the slide a lot better. We honestly, every time that slide showed up at CWAC before, we would go a little crazy over that. I, I appreciate what you did there. Um, so, and, and the other thing to keep in mind is that orange line that represents rainwater harvesting is not to scale. It usually says that on there, Claire. Maybe it was there now. It's, it is just an estimate. Um, it's a really hard thing to estimate, uh, but I think uh, the Storm to Shade folks are working to make those numbers more reliable. Um, and I, I could say a whole lot of other things, but uh, uh, regarding um, demand hardening, um, statewide, we're seeing hardening of demand. We're using about the same amount of water in Arizona now per capita that we used. Well, no, a lot less per capita. The total amount of water we use in Arizona is the, about the same as we used uh, when we had only a million people living in the state. And that graph's right on the ADWR website. But demand is hardening. At some point, it, it just becomes harder and harder to squeeze more water out. And um, that's where we are. Uh, hopefully, technology is going to really be helping us out. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Allison. Um, are there any more questions for Andrew? Andrew, thank you very much for that great presentation. And if you could get out those uh, slides out to the board supervisors and members, it would greatly be appreciated so constituents can see your good work. Yeah, will do. Thank you, Scott. Okay, next on the agenda is going to be the CIP um, subcommittee report by Asia Filbert. Asia, it's all yours. Thank you, Scott. Uh, 
Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, the CIP committee did meet on uh, earlier this month on Friday the 13th, and the subcommittee members heard from um, Jaime Rivera and uh, Jackson Jenkins um, presenting on the projects uh, and the coordination with the CPO, the, the, the new coordination with that office um, uh, about you know, project management, how that was um, going to go moving forward. Uh, and generally, the subcommittee felt it was a well-considered program of projects and um, management for both rehab, um, major repairs, uh, and new and uh, future current projects and, and future projects. Uh, and the subcommittee voted uh, to recommend to the full committee um, to support uh, this their uh, department's plan uh, moving forward. Uh, and so I think we have some, so I, yeah, just to, to be clear about that, the subcommittee um, was in favor of what was presented, felt it was well considered and wanted to recommend to the full committee to support the program. And I think that we have the uh, full committee was provided a copy of the what those projects look like um, in the um, in the meeting invite. And then I think, Jackson, were you going to talk more about that um, so to give the full committee a, an overview or Jaime? I don't know if Jaime's there, here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, Jaime's here with me and I was just gonna leave it up to the committee if, if they would like me to share uh, the perspective or summary of that plan to the whole committee, I could do so. Um, it's, it's really up to the committee what they'd like to hear. Okay, thanks. So Scott, um, I will uh, turn it to you and the committee in terms of what you would like to hear. Um, and then if my fellow subcommittee members have anything to add. Okay, uh, can somebody help me here? Are we making a vote decision or something uh, from the CIP? I, I would like, yes, we would like to have the full committee uh, consider that that vote. The the subcommittee has uh, is recommending that we support, and I might ask Veronica or somebody to help us with what I think Emory had a good motion in our subcommittee um, in terms of what the um, RWAC is um, tasked, you know, with doing with, you know, we don't really approve, but we can sort of recommend. It seems like the committee should have at least an seemed like the committee should at least have an overview of what we yeah. saw in the CIP. So I, I really do think Jackson should give an overview of everything so the full committee knows what was said. And, and I think the other thing we'd ask for in addition to an overview for the full committee is maybe a little more um, detail on the methodology of prioritizing CIP projects. And maybe that's not ready for this meeting, but I think maybe it's a future meeting we want to understand more about the prioritization process. Actually, if I recall, Mark, yeah. we had asked for that to be at the next subcommittee meeting, that prioritization, so. Was that where it was? Okay. Not, not for this meeting, yes. But I, I, I agree that giving the full committee an, an um, overview would be would be a good idea. Okay, very good. I'll, I'll just run through a summary of, of what Jaime presented uh, to the subcommittee. I'll do that for the whole committee. And Veronica is going to pull up the five-year plan that was the primary focus of the of the subcommittee meeting. And so, if if you could scroll to the bottom first on that one, can you all see that? Yes. Okay. Uh, right to the right bottom, right there. Stop. That's good, right there. So, first and foremost, the blue colored or the highlighted columns that at the very bottom has just over $54 million. That is for this coming fiscal year. That's what we're proposing, $54 million, $54.5 million for this coming fiscal year. And then each of the additional four columns are the following year. So uh, that you could see the first three years of the five-year plan, we're projecting 54 million approximately each year in capital. And then in year four and year five, it jumps up into the 80 million. We got 88 million and 85 million, if you can see those. Um, now scroll back to the top. The, the primary reason, right there's good. 
The primary reason for that jump in year four and year five, that's when we are projecting that we're going to get started on a new regional facility in the Sawarita area. Um, that's kind of our, our five year plan, and that's where we start spending some bigger money. And so just a layout of these dollars, um, the way this is broken down, the first three projects at the top of this document are current projects that are underway that are going to have spending in next year and or future years. So the Continental Ranch pump station, um, that's a big capital project we're working on this year, and we will spend almost $9 million on it next year to close it out. So we've already spent money. We made it a top priority to complete the project so we don't waste or lose the money that we've already invested so far in that capital effort. Um, following that one is the Kanoa Ranch sewer extension, and we have uh, $5 million to be spent next year, and that's basically to extend our sewer line out to the Kanoa Ranch area. It's a project that's going on now, and that will just uh, uh, be the spend to get it out there where we have, A, some additional uh, commercial development activity that we need to reach to, and also the county has the Kanoa Ranch uh, historical site that uh, they uh, put in some uh, RV sites and whatnot, and we need service to that location as well. Um, I misspoke to the subcommittee about phase two of that project. Phase two of that project um, was a bit pricey, and so we would decide whether to do phase decide whether to do phase two or not. Um, but that additional money, that four and a half million in year two and three million in year three is for phase two and that's to take the canoa ranch line all the way to aravata junction where we have our last remaining lagoon in service and we think that's the right thing to do but we still need to do a little bit more discussion internal discussion and evaluation because it's not very expensive to run that lagoon um, but to spend another seven and a half million dollars on a pipeline, you could run that lagoon for a long time for that amount of money. So we just need to make sure for all the right reasons, uh, we would love to shut the lagoon down, bring that new water or the Aravaca Junction uh, sewage water into the Green Valley or ultimately the Sawarita, the new Sarita regional plant in the future as a viable renewable water source. But um, just a lot of discussions that we're still going to have and fine tune that spend on that project. But again, these are projects that are going on right now. And the third one being the Trace Rios Headworks biofilter odor project that's in construction right now. Um, and that one's carrying over into next year as well. Um, we understand some of the switch gear, the electrical components of that project have been delayed as much as supply chain issues have. And so we have to carry that project out, and that's why it's there. But we want to wrap up all three of those existing projects. That's about $14 million worth of work just for next year. Then, then we move into very small numbers, and I'll just summarize those uh, six projects. Uh, one's odor control projects, one's pump station projects, minor mod projects, sewer manhole re rehab projects, minor pipe rehab, and treatment rehab. Those are what we call our buckets, and every year we put in funding in our buckets, and I'll tell you more about that a little lower in the spreadsheet, but since we're doing those pro projects, those bucket projects right now this year, we do them right up to the end of the year. You know, June 30th, we'll, we'll be wrapping up most of those projects, and we never are exactly sure of the final spend number until all the invoices come in. So we just carry over minimal dollars into the next year. So if there's a little bit of carryover dollars, we can close out the project without creating a, an administrative nightmare for us. So we put $1,000 out there to carry over into next year to close out this year's projects in those buckets. And if you go down to the next uh, projects below, those are the same buckets. Like the first one is the odor project and it's really a four hundred ninety nine thousand is a dollar a year thousand dollar a year project. And 
we budget that for each of the five years. So that's why if you go down, the next five projects are odor. Then after that, the next five are pump station and so on and so forth. That's just the funding we're identifying um, at a fairly consistent rehab rate to reinvest in our system and keep our infrastructure up to speed. So that's just you know, what you're looking at there. Each of those buckets has a detailed specific list of actual, you know, where those dollars are be spent and being spent. You know, which intersection, which manholes are included, or which uh, pipeline is being repaired or replaced, and so on and so forth. So this is just kind of the summary of those, but that's where we do the bulk of our rehab work. And when you add up those six programs and buckets, you can see we're typically in the 20, 21, 21 million range, but next year we're only at almost 19 million. We had to steal a couple million from there in order to use it for uh, closing out one of the upper projects. So it, it's kind of the buckets are used a little bit in our balancing of the funds to make sure we try and stay at a fairly steady state on our spend rate. And I'll tell you more about how that enters into our our user fee rates that we charge people here at the end of this. Um, let's go down a little more. And I know I'm talking fast, but I'm just trying to summarize it as quickly as I can, and hopefully it'll generate the questions you may have. Then um, the next group of projects are our bigger intercept interceptor rehabilitation projects, and those are uh, another five projects that we know from our CCTV effort that we're going to have to go do some rehab on some of those bigger pipelines. And we figure they're in the $5 million ballpark. Of course, inflation and everything else will have an influence on that. But we've budgeted $5 million for each of those segments of interceptor rehabilitation and put them in those years that they fall under the, the proper columns. And then finally, uh, we have um, a number of special projects or uh, carbon footprint print reduction projects or projects with econ economic payback, um, various different things that we think are important. And that's, you know, the last list of items on this project. So, you know, we've been talking about the Animox project, which is a low energy uh, technology for nitrification, denitrification, which is the primary unit process we have in the treatment of sewage. And we've done a lot of research and a lot of testing, but we would still like to go forward. But initially we had some pretty high bids come in for doing this project. And so we pulled it back off and said, nope, we can't do it. It's just too pricey. And so we've done a little bit of value engineering. And we think that this that we can now do that project for six million dollars. So we're budgeting for it next year to go out. And if we get bids, around that six million dollars or less it's a go we're going to move forward and do that project uh we also have some augmentation projects mixed into this next group and that's where we know we have some capacity issues in our conveyance system and um, there's one uh, on drachman uh, that we need to deal with so that one's out there in year five but we know it's coming and of course growth doesn't necessarily stay flat and doesn't just necessarily focus an even distribution around the community. Sometimes it gets concentrated in a geographic area. So in augmentation projects are quite flexible. But we do the best to identify where we think the next augmentation is needed, and we just continue to track our hydraulic model and all of our research that we do to make sure we stay ahead of growth and that's just all I can tell you about that one. Uh, same, you see another interceptor uh, augmentation on the Pantano. Uh, the same, uh, we need a relief sewer to do away with the Prudence pump station. Uh, the Sarita interceptor Green Valley, that's part of building a new plant out there in Sawarita. The intent would be that it would shut, allow us to shut down the Green Valley facility and ultimately the Corona de Tucson facility. And of course, the lagoon uh, that's out there at Air Vaca Junction, but we do need a place to take it to and um, the timing of it, all, all those things have to come in together. And it's just a, you know, a kind of a look at it here with the way we've laid out the spend on this stuff. 
Uh, you see the Sarita plant, the big dollars on the Sarita wastewater reclamation facility. Um, we have to do some upgrades on our electrical system at the digesters next year for 2.2 million. Um, we also, uh, one of our big energy efficiency and uh, carbon footprint reduction projects is the Class A biosolids, the second to the last project there. And that's where we're going to use solar dryers to take our biosolids from around a 20% solid take upwards of 80 to 90% dry take. Um, it reduces from having nine or 10 truckloads a day down to maybe three truckloads a day going out um, uh, to, for use of, of that fertilizer. And by making a Class A product, we broaden and open up more markets for the use of those biosolids. And uh, we just think that's a, a great opportunity for us right there. And so we're still pursuing that. We're out right now uh, looking for uh, some bids on that project. And then uh, emergency backup power, the only facility that doesn't have direct backup power is Trace Rios. And we were told we were approved for a grant. We haven't received the grant yet, but uh, we, we can get out of that $3 million estimate for the project, we can get about $2.25 million back through the grant. So we'd pay, I think that's 25%. Um, a worthwhile project to do, assuming we get the funding, mm -hmm but also the delivery on the uh, generators is quite lengthy with the supply chain issues. So the timing, you know, most of it would be in the following year, not next year, but one more year out. So sorry, I talked fast and rambled, but that's just a quick summary of how we're gonna spend about 50 million a year until we get into what we believe will be the, the Sarita project. And it jumps up into the mid eighties there. And all of those numbers, we, we looked at not only our operations and maintenance budget, which we'll talk about here after this agenda topic, but our capital spend, the numbers we're projecting when we look at the rate workbook that you guys go through every year with finance, the, these values will not cause us to have to raise our user fees to pay for them um, based on the, the assumptions and inputs that we've used this be capital spend rate being one of them. So this looks good for not having to raise rates at this spend rate. And these are the projects we feel are the most important or most valuable for us. So with that, I'll shut up finally and take questions. Are there any questions for Jackson? Yeah. Uh, we have Allison Jones uh, has a question. You're muted, Allison, Allison. You're muted. We cannot hear you, I would, Allison. I would like to make a motion that we uh, we go with the CIP subcommittee's recommendation and approve this budget. Um, and we can discuss that if if you wish. If there's a second, there a second uh, for the motion. I'll second. second. Oh, cool. Actually, can I, can I just make a comment? I mean, technically, we don't approve the budget, but we recommend to the Board of Supervisors or that. Oh, thank you. They approve it. OK, thank you. Um, I, I should agree. I should amend that that yeah. motion then. I move that we recommend to the Board of Supervisors that they approve the CIP budget. So we have a revised uh, motion. Do um, I have a second on the revised motion? Well, second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Do I have any no's? Aye. Do I have any abstains? Technically, we should have had a discussion, actually, but. OK. Uh, Before the vote. Right. So do we hold off on the emotion uh, on the motion uh, to have a discussion? No, that no, you mo move second, then have discussion, then have a vote. OK, um, so then I guess we've had our motion and second. Uh, so now we're in the discussion. Um, anybody have anything to discuss? Um, I, I would just say it's 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 pretty hard to get everything 
when you haven't had a chance to look at it in this committee and um, it's because I have faith in our in our uh, CIP committee that I feel comfortable with this. So thank you for your hard work on looking over everything carefully. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, I agree. I, it, there is a lot and <laughs> we we had a good meeting, um, I think on right last couple weeks ago, Friday. I'd just like to suggest that uh, if anybody would like to delay the vote to give more time to uh, review the proposal, uh, I'm certainly open to the idea of uh, holding off till the next meeting. Well, we have a motion and a second, so we do need to vote on it. If, if you want to hold off, you would vote no on the motion that's on the floor. Okay. Uh, I think uh, you had a motion, a second, and a vote. So if you're going to change that, then you have to have a motion to uh, remove the vote or redo the thing. But I agree there should have been discussion between uh, the members. I think we're nullifying that vote because we got ahead of ourselves on the discussion. We're having the discussion now. And at the end of that discussion, we'll call for the vote again and see where it resides. Right, and I, I think technically, though, it is right that we do have to vote to nullify the, the vote that we already took. So if I understand, we have an initial motion, a second discussion, and now we're going to have a vote um, to either accept it or to uh, nullify it um, so we could uh, revise that motion. Is that correct? If someone makes that motion. I'll make the motion just to keep us legally straight. So if there's a second to that, we can continue. And is your vote, your, your motion, Armando, to nullify the initial vote on this uh, capital uh, budget approval? Uh, yes, to allow us to have a discussion. Yeah, so we're. The motion second. is, and there's a second. So voting to nullify the prior vote you just took on the capital budget so that we can appropriately continue with our discussion. Yes. So all in favor say aye. 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 Any uh, no's or abstains? So it sounds like we're back to square one. You're back at discussion yes. on this topic. The motion and second still. So Rob has um, uh, discuss, uh, a question on the discussion. Yeah, actually I have a comment. Um, you know, we received these materials uh, ahead of time. Um, I looked them over and I did have, I, I wasn't 100% sure what I was looking at, but after um, Jackson's uh, review of of what this really is all about. Um, I feel confident that I know um, what this entails and I don't really see for me for me personally, I don't really need to delay a vote on it. But um, if everybody else thinks that's a good idea, I'm OK with that too. Any additional discussion? OK, um, if we're all done with discussion, uh, do I have uh, a motion uh, to? We already have a motion. No, we have the motion. We, oh, we nullified our vote. So now we are going back to vote. We're closing the discussion and we're going back to vote on the initial okay. motion that was made. OK. OK, so since we've nullified uh, the first and we're back uh, to this, we're original uh, motion. Um, now we get to go back and vote a second time. Um, so all in uh, favor, uh, say aye. 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 Any no's? Any abstains? 
So it looks like uh, the CIP uh, recommendation from the advisory committee has been uh, approved. Okay, next um, on the agenda. Um, and Owen, is there anything else, any questions for Asia uh, regarding any of this? And thank you, Asia, for um, uh, sharing all this. Okay, well, thank you, Asia. Uh, next, on the, next on the agenda is the financial subcommittee uh, with Matt Matthewson. Matt's not here, so I think Corinne is going to. So, Corinne, I understand you're uh, subbing in for Matt? Yes. Okay, I'm it's all some... yours, ma'am. Great. Yeah, so I'm having some computer issues on my phone, so I'm on my phone. Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, so for our financial subcommittee report, we met on Teams last Friday on January 20th. And the department submitted its initial proposed budget on January 13th, and finance is in the process of reviewing it now. Um, we heard from Jackson that it's, it's essentially the same as last year's base budget except for increases in um, eight different cost areas. Um, and the result is expected to be about a 4% increase over last year, um, mainly due to inflationary increases in chemicals, electricity, and repair and maintenance costs. Um, and there's a likely additional increase due to salary raises that were approved last year. Um, and we also heard about uh, an ongoing compensation study that is scheduled to be completed um, this month. And um, in February, there's going to be some work to, to implement the compensation study, which will then have uh, an impact on the department's budget. So a final budget proposal isn't required until February 13th, um, recognizing that there may be some changes to that budget because of uh, that ongoing compensation study. Next, uh, we heard about the fiscal year 23-24 financial plan. So the department is working with finance on that plan and the financial subcommittee reviewed and discussed the key assumptions um, used in the financial plan. Um, we didn't look at um, any of the cash flow numbers, the rate note, rate workbook yet that will be forthcoming. We have a um, we'll meet as a financial subcommittee again at the beginning of March um, to review the financial plan, and then the financial subcommittee. Um, well, then we can um, bring it to the full committee in our March meeting. I think the March meeting is scheduled towards the end of the month. So that would be after our financial subcommittee meeting. I think that's everything that I had. Um, Mark or Armando, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? No, okay. I think that's good. Great. And I see Allison has her hand up. Sorry, that is a mistake. Oh, okay. All good. Hey, Corinne, this is Jackson. Can I uh, just kind of give a little update to help Please. With the whole committee? So, yeah, we did have good discussion, as you've indicated. Thank you for that. But we are in the middle of county budgeting activity. I call it the, the dance, the budget dance. And so every day there's tweaks and updates. And so if we had a meeting right now, I guarantee you by the end of the day or tomorrow, there's going to be new information or a change. So in general, the department's focus and goal in working with finance is to submit a budget that A, of course, allows us to operate and maintain the sewer infrastructure and system the way we've been accustomed to and meet all our permits and be good neighbors and service providers and not cause odors and all kinds of things, all while keeping it 
without having to raise our rates as we've been able to do for the past several years. So with that, you know, I just summarize the capital that we've proposed that helps fit into that no rate increase model, yet allows us to do the things we believe are important. And the committee just uh, supported that and gave an endorsement, as you all heard. Now for the O&M budget, it's a little more challenging um, because you know inflation is being the biggest upward pressure on our budget. So last year, just the operations and maintenance budget that we used was around $92 million. And in that rate workbook that um, finance has goes over with this committee, uh, we looked at it prior to coming up with all our values. And we, we made an assumption that if we're able to budget within with only a 5% inflate inflationary type increase or a budget increase of about 5%. And with those capital numbers we submitted, we should be able to keep our current user fee rates and not have to go ask for more rates. So we've submitted a preliminary budget to finance. There was still, I had a meeting with finance yesterday, my team and the finance team met and we had numerous discussions, but there's still a lot of activities and tweaks being made. Um, that 5% number, it looked like the inputs that were given were a little bit above the 5% for supplies and services. And then the other comment that Corinne was starting to make was um, this current fiscal year that we're in, back when it started in July, the board approved uh, hourly wage increases for pretty much all of the county, of course, all the wastewater. And those increases varied from, I believe, 1% to 8% based on an employee's hourly rate. And if, you know, all that noise, if you were just to estimate that impact, it was probably an overall about a 5% wage increase. At that time in July, when they approved that change, they did not allow us to budget for it. So as we now are budgeting for this next fiscal year, everyone's wages on average are about 5% more than they were last year's budget. So wage and benefits is almost 40% of our budget, of our operations and maintenance budget. So approximately 5%, I'm expecting an approximate 5% increase just from activities that have already taken place. And now we're planning for them for next year. But parallel to that, the county has embarked on an entire countywide uh, wage and compensation study that is just now wrapping up. In fact, I think I heard it just finished this week. And now county administration, human resources, finance, and many others will have to digest that information and then take a look at what that impact of the recommendation might be, not just on wastewater, but property taxes and everything else, and then determine how to implement some or all or whatever portion of that recommendation and over what time period. So there's an expectation, at least we're believing that there could be some additional increases for county employees, and I'm, uh, I'm focused on wastewater employees. So already I need to increase 5% on wages and benefits because of what already has taken place back in July, just to get up to current, and whatever is going to be the county administration's recommendation to the board for future additional increases, which I'm expecting there probably will be some. So you can see just on 40% of the wastewater budget of wages and benefits, um, it's probably going to be exceeding, I'm speculating it could exceed the 5% inflationary value that we're hoping to hold things within. So um, everything else, supplies and services right now are just over 5%, but we're just wrapping up this phase or this round of the budget inputs, and we plan to meet next week, Wastewater does, to go through and double check and challenge ourselves to make sure we weren't being conservative or soft anywhere in the budget and see if there's any additional reductions we can make before the budget 
um, you know, I, I see Carmine DeBonis, my boss has joined us on this meeting and he's meeting with all of his public works teams here in about uh, a week's time. I think I have one week until we meet with him to go over that final refined draft proposal to see what feedback and input him and the county administration side of things has for that budget. But right now we're really close to that 5% number, maybe a little high, which I'm hoping we can refine closer to 5% um, and propose that to Carmine fairly soon. And based on the preliminary rate workbook exercise, it would look like we won't have to ask for higher user fees. So a great thing. But that question about what to do with wages and benefits based on the big compensation study and what if any other uh, areas of inflation on supplies and services we couldn't push down a little bit? We may be pushing up against that, and we'll see what that looks like in the rate workbook. But um, that that was my additional update or summary to what Corinne just said. Now, feel free to ask questions. And since I do see Carmine on there on the phone, Carmine, if you want to say anything, feel free to. Otherwise, I'll turn it back over to the committee. Jackson, thanks for just acknowledging, um, you know, the process that we're going through. I, I think, as you pointed out, uh, there are lots of efforts underway and lots of moving parts. Uh, we're all trying to get to the right outcomes. So, you know, your um, advisory committee obviously uh, is an important part of that, and I'm interested in hearing the rest of the discussion here. And as you noted, uh, we will continue making our way along to arriving at a recommended uh, budget from the county administrator to the board of supervisors, and then moving on that way. Obviously, that enables us to meet all the operational and capital needs of not just wastewater, but all of the departments, and takes into consideration uh, the current economic and and future economic uh, factors that we're all facing. So uh, happy to answer any questions if subcommittee members uh, or the committee members have them for me. And before you ask Carmine any questions or myself or whatever, I also um, just this, you know, it's, I call it the budget dance and our partners are finance. And I see Meredith and Mandy and Isai on the phone or on the team's meeting from the finance side. And so I don't want to exclude them. If any of them had anything to add, then we'll go back towards discussion and questions as Carmine requested. I will just add that the meeting that you referred to, Jackson, is scheduled for Thursday, February 2nd. That's when uh, Mr. DeBonis will have his uh, preview of your budget. Very good. Thank you, Mandy. Okay. Any comments, questions, discussion? Allison, no, you had a question um, earlier, but then you took it off. Do you still have that question, ma'am? No, that was a mistake. OK. So as Jackson said, uh, is there any more discussion, any questions or anything like that? OK, well, it sounds like uh, that's it for the financial law uh, subcommittee. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, as we move forward, uh, we go into the fiscal year 22-23 uh, expense and revenue summary with, uh, uh, is it pronounced Isha? Isai. 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 OK, thank you. So Isai, yes, it's right. all yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'll share my screen here. And We'll go on our way. Yeah, uh, anybody see my, everybody see my screen? Yes. Excellent. So this is an expensive revenue summary for period six ended in December 31st. Our total for O&M expenses uh, is adopted budget 91.4 million uh, up to the up to Period six, we have spent 42 million. Our projection is 90.7 million. Our total O&M expenditures, including the contract depreciation and debt services, comes to a total of 170.9 million. Up today, we have spent 78 million point eight, and the projection is 170 million with a positive of a 
$893,000. Uh, moving down to our revenue, our adopted budget is $193.6 million. So far, we have $89.7 million, and we're projected to have $192 million with a shortage of about $1.6 million of revenue. And in a nutshell, that's the numbers that we have so far. Any questions? Does anybody have any questions for ESAE? Well, ESAE must have done a good job. Get off light. Uh, thank you very much. Rob, Rob has a question. Oh. Okay, you snuck it in there, Rob. Uh, you got yeah, a I, for yeah, I have a question. Um, uh, with the uh, the potential for continuing uh, salary increases, um, and and also the difficulty of of finding full employment within the department, um, uh, how are we going to continue to budget for personnel, which is as as Jackson said, is forty percent of our budget. For O and M, um, I think personally, I think it's important for us to have a a, a large workforce, a well qualified workforce, and well paid workforce who we can maintain them. And I understand that it, that's a really difficult thing for the department, but um, I think we need to budget for um, pretty much full employment. And uh, so that's that's my only comment. And if you have anything to say about that or or Jackson, uh, I'd appreciate that. Thanks, uh, Rob. Great point. Thank you for that. Um, and yes, the department is budgeting for full employment or full allotment of staff at full time basis, 20, 80 hours a year, just like we did this fiscal year. Um, if we don't achieve that, we'll see will overspend because we'll be using contract help as we're doing this year to keep our head above water. We have to pay an outside higher rate than we would even pay internally. And so those are the challenges. And then when that happens, OK, well, what are you going to not do in order to offset that extra money you paid? So the best, most efficient way is for us to get it full staff, to operate with that full staff and do all the things that we want to do at those known rates and under our control. But if that doesn't happen, if we run with a high vacancy rate, um, you know, there's a little swing there, but not much. And you get to where you have to use contractors or you pay people overtime. And, you know, that has its limitations as well. And, and those are all the tools in the tool chest to do it. But we will budget for full staff at full time basis. Hopefully the study will allow us to improve our marketability competitiveness in the wage category um, to give us a little more ability to do that but we're survivalists we're going to get it done and survive and keep this system going as it needs to um, it's just unfortunate it usually comes at the cost of something else you know we have to okay we're gonna do this that or the other thing and it's not always a good thing that we like to do but that's what you got to do to keep within the confines of the rules of engagement that you have to perform with this is Scott Oldendorf. I have a question for whoever can answer the question best. Um, how much understaffed are we? Is it like by a certain percentage? And also because we have to outsource uh, to contractors and that um, percentage, millions of dollars or whatever, is it um, affecting us having to spend more on our budget uh, for these contractors? So. For much of the fiscal year, we've run at an approximate 10% vacancy rate. Um, right now, we're just below 9%, so we've made a little bit of gains, um, which is nice. But we'd like, you know, with normal turnover and the high level of retirements with the aging workforce and all that silver tsunami, you know, we'd like to get below 5% on our vacancy rate and turn around our jobs quicker than we have been, which is another effort we're working on. Um, but just one example of outside help, um, you know, for a, quite some time, we had 30% vacancy in our uh, electrical journeyman electrical positions, and their fully loaded wage and benefit probably was 
30 to $35 an hour, you know, fully loaded benefits and all. Um, but when you're down 30%, you still have electrical work. So we hired electrical contractors. We had two electrical subcontractors that one charged us $67 an electrical hour and one charged 76 an electrical hour. So approximately twice as much for the electrical hour that we had to pay when we when we couldn't do without. We've been fortunate enough that we filled, you know, we got down to 10% vacancy, but then we had uh, some electricians go out on long-term illness, you know, personal medical issues. So we were right, even though we had bodies in some vacant slots, we didn't have the people in the field. So just the normal day-to-day -day stuff you deal with. Um, but most recently, you, you know, you fill vacancies and so it's kind of a moving target, but right now we've been very short in our heavy duty mechanical maintenance group of, in, of journeyman skill sets. And, and we've had it in the past, it was in the laboratory. So it moves around and it impacts how you do your business and you deal with it at that moment in time with whatever you have to do. But we're putting a lot of hope and emphasis on the county study and improving our competitiveness in the marketplace to where we can drop our uh, vacancy rate and get back into a smoother sailing as we go forward. But Jackson, uh, thank you for the vacancy rate information, but um, when we have to outsource to the contractors, how much uh, does that financially impact uh, the budget? Uh, does it uh, boost it by a certain percentage uh, or are we a certain number of million over of expenses that we would have never had to pay if we were fully staffed? Yeah, I, I can't tell you that detail, uh, Scott, unfortunately. Um, I just know that when we use you know, for the things we normally would or could do if we had the staffing, when we have to pay outside help, it costs more. And so in order to stay within your budget, you're going to have to cut something else out in order to do that. And we just like to do that to a minimal, and that's what we're focused on. Great, thank you. Anybody else have any uh, questions for uh, Isai um, or Jackson or anybody? Thank you, Isai um, and uh, Jackson for all that uh, additional input. Uh, next on the agenda is going to be our uh, Citizen Water Advisory Committee, CWAC, uh, with Allison Jones. Allison, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, CWAC met on January 4th, and um, Director Kamik's report was interesting. He talked about a, a Marin Council study session on the Storm Shade program, which you all uh, heard a little bit about today from Andrew. Um, the Council, apparently, Marin Council is okay with moving forward on creating a permanent program, and they would set a fee to that, on add a fee to, to bills for that of about 13 cents per 100 cubic feet. Um, uh, upcoming are some rate increase proposals. You may have seen this written up in the Tucson paper. Tucson Water is proposing a 5.5% increase per year for the next four years. Um, also, Mayor and Council will be discussing potential approval. The Mayor and Council will be discussing potential approval of this and also discussing a cap resource fee that would go from 70 cents to a dollar uh, per uh, user. That actually does go to, into effect in February. Um, annual rate increases will go into effect on July 1st of every year. Um, City of Tucson, Tucson Water in particular, is having similar problems with vacancies that uh, Pima County Wastewater is. Um, there was an update on the Colorado River. Uh, Tucson Water did decide not to go ahead with delivery of 26,000 acre feet of water that they had the right to buy last year, and they were compensated by the Bureau of Reclamation for that, $261 per acre foot. Um, and the Bureau is asking to leave more in the river. The city will participate, but they have not decided on how much. Um, and uh, 
it, it was noted, of course, that the city of Tucson has five and a half waters, years of water banked underground right now. There was a discussion about the Arizona WIFA board, uh, which is the new water financing authority where they that was set up by Governor Ducey. Um, a proposal came to them for a desal plant um, for um, that would be near Rocky Point, basically. Um, the WIFA board decided to just keep the discussion open. They're not making any commitments on that. Um, a number of staff, Tucson Water staff, did attend the Colorado River Water Users Association in Las Vegas, which meets every year. This year's meeting was all about saving um, the lake energy system. Uh, there is not a lot of info from the Bureau of Reclamation except that the situation is still critical. Um, the, and uh, apparently, one of the takeaways from one of the staff was that agricultural users have mostly not been cooperating regarding efforts to leave water in the river. Uh, Molly Collins made a wonderful presentation on the well drilling program and planning process for Tucson Water. Tucson Water has about 206 water production wells, and a well doesn't last forever. They degrade, they break down, you need to replace them, or you might not have wells where you need them, where the service area is needed. So they're constantly evaluating that. And she just, it's, it's a significant part of their budget. So she spoke to us about that. Um, that is a uh, report on CWAC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Allison. Does anybody have any questions for Allison on CWAC? I see Steve Foley has a question for you, ma'am. Yes. Right. Uh, you mentioned uh, agriculture users not uh, cooperating in uh, Colorado River uh, water allocation. What what exactly do you mean by that? Well, um, they everyone who gets cap water um, has been asked to not take as much as they have in the past. And they have and the Bureau of Reclamation has offered to compensate uh, those who do leave water in. Um, so the, the city of Tucson, for example, decided, OK, we'll leave 26,000 acre feet in the river or the lakes. Uh, but agriculture, agricultural users have not been willing to do similar actions. P perhaps Mark Taylor could speak better to that but that's that was the that was okay. the takeaway great and thank I, you and i and, and i think they're probably and i wasn't the meeting I, i'm assuming they're referring to on river agricultural users um you know anything that cap delivers where we we are not delivering any um ag water to agriculture anymore so they really don't have anything to give up so I'm assuming yeah. they're referring to the on river, the Yuma agricultural. Actually, I, th I think you're right, and I should have mentioned that, Mark. Thank you. Colorado River comes into Arizona through the Cap Canal, but there are also agricultural users along the river that take it directly out of the river. Anybody else have any additional questions for Allison? Thank you very Thank much, you. Allison. That was very informative. A lot of information. Um, next on the agenda is future agenda items. Does anybody have a future agenda item they would like to give? Um, I I noticed that uh, uh, we were supposed to get a, a technical services and engineering update from Eric uh, for this month. Um, is that going to be rescheduled? Yes, that's going to be rescheduled. Eric was unavailable for this meeting, so we'll okay. try to find another month when um, he can give that update. OK, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any additional uh, questions uh, for Allison? Or, I'm sorry, we already did that uh, for future agenda items. I'm sorry.
Okay, all right, guess that's it for future agenda items. Uh, now we have call to the audience. Any comments for call to the audience? Again, I would like to, um, uh, I have one question. I haven't seen the newsletter um, going out. Has that uh, been uh, reduced, slowed down, stopped, or anything like that? The pipeline. It's um, it's out there electronically. We don't make a hard copy anymore. It's an electronic Ooh. only. And it's on a, a link on our web page, but we could forward yeah. that link. Is it for the yeah. public though? Yeah, I was always looking forward to the hard copies. For the <laughs> committee, we can give it to the committee. It might not be a, a link after all, but we'll we'll forward a link or, or a copy of yeah, it to you. I guys. enjoyed that. Yeah, thank you. Um, next, uh, I'd like to announce uh, some vacancies. I want to uh, give a great kudo and thanks out to Mark Taylor. Um, Mark Taylor has um, a lot of things going. We pulled at him from all different directions, but he's just uh, so busy. So, Mark, uh, why don't you explain uh, what's going on with you? Sure, no problem. Yeah, I did give an, um, uh, a notice to um, Supervisor Hunts that I, I will be um, uh, resigning from uh, the RAC committee, and mainly just because, as you know, I missed a lot of meetings. It, the um, the meeting typically lands on top of my officers' meeting for CAP, and I have to go to the CAP meetings on um, higher priority. So I'm really sorry I missed a bunch of those meetings. So I, I just felt that um, it's probably best to get somebody on here that can make all the meetings and provide the time that's really needed to this. So. I did put in my resignation to um, Supervisor Hines. I told him I'd stay on until he finds um, a replacement. And I think they're in that process now. And, and I think uh, Jackson is also helping in that process. So um, I do want to say I've enjoyed immensely all the years I've been on here, and I really hate to leave, believe me. But um, anyway, that's that's what I did. And sure going to miss everybody here, that's for sure. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. We're going to sorely miss you, Mark. You've been of uh, great service to us over the years. Um, also, uh, on the administrative end, uh, our right arm, we could not function here at all unless we had Veronica. Uh, Veronica, um, do you want to say anything? Um, just that, you know, it's been my pleasure to work with you, and I will be um, probably still see me um, in a couple meetings here with Jeanette. So, um, I'll still be with the department, just working, you know, in a different function. And Jeanette, uh, we have uh, Jeanette Lee will become our new right arm. Uh, so Jeanette, maybe you could uh, say hello to everybody and give a comment so we know who you are. Hello, um, I've been with uh, RWRD since 2015. Um, just taking over for Veronica now, learning the ropes. She will be an invaluable resource for quite some time um, until I learned all the moving parts. So it's a pleasure to work with you. And um, for everybody's information, uh, Jeanette, do you have the same phone number? And uh, no, no, no so, we'll get that out. Yeah, uh, so I'll send all so that out. They'll yeah. put that out with the correct email that we can stay in contact. Excellent. OK, um, so do we have a motion uh, to adjourn this meeting? I move that we adjourn this meeting. Do I I'll second? Second. I second. Yeah. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any no's? Aye. Any abstains? OK, I guess we got out of here at uh, 949, a little bit later than we usually have done, but we've had a lot of information. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, here's a new 2023 to everyone. Welcome aboard. Great, great meeting. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank bye bye. Thank you.